I'm here today with Eileen Andrade, and she is the owner and creator at uh, Finca. How are you doing today, Eileen? I'm great. How are you? I'm doing awesome. Well, I am really excited for this conversation. Uh, you know, to give everybody a little context, you've got three restaurants there in, in South Florida, specifically the Kendall and Doral area, if you're familiar with, with South Florida, and that's Finca, Amelia's 1913, and Barbacoa. Um, very exciting. So, so Eileen, how, how did you get into this? Uh, you know, maybe give us the, the, the short version of, of your ascent to where you are right now. I'll try to give you the shortest version possible. Um, so my parents grew up in the, the restaurant industry. My grandfather had a couple of restaurants in Cuba, five restaurants and bars in Cuba. Um, they came over to Miami for political reasons. And my grandfather continued to work in the restaurant industry, came here with 500 bucks and started off as a bus boy and built his way up until he had his first restaurant called El Teide, which was like a eight seating countertop where they didn't really have a menu. It was kind of whatever he could find and put together. And it was, my grandfather was the chef. My uncle was a sous chef. My mom was the server and my grandmother was making the coffee. So that's how we started here in Miami. Uh, fast forward 44 years later, my mom has two restaurants called Islas Canarias the Canary Islands. Um, that's where my great grandparents are from. And, uh, and yeah, I grew up in the industry, but seeing as laborious and demanding as it was, I kind of said, I do not want to follow in my mom's footsteps. So I went to, um, to design school and I studied fashion merchandising and I got a bachelor's in fashion merchandising. And I did uh, styling for a couple of years here in Miami. But at the time, you know, fashion wasn't, it's still not at its peak in Miami, but it just wasn't where, you know, it wasn't where New York and LA was. And, and I wasn't really willing to move there. So I, I said, you know what, I'm going to take a break from fashion and I'm going to go ahead and give uh, this family business thing a shot. So I went ahead and started working with, uh, with my mom at a, a bakery that I helped her open, which was a bakery and a restaurant as well. We were kind of trying to find you know, the angle. And I kind of was, I said, let's just do two and one. We'll do a half of it, a bakery and the other half, we'll do a full service restaurant. So that ended up um, being very successful. And that's where I kind of got my feet wet. I started off with managing and, um, and it was interesting. I had to manage people a lot older than me when I was 20 years old, but uh, it taught me a lot. And after managing, I went to back of the house. So I did hotline. I did, you know, pastry, I was helping do like croquetas, bocaditos. I did all the stations and I realized that my heart was really in, in the back of the house. And, and I just like love the adrenaline in the kitchen. And, and that's just like kind of what sparked this whole thing of like, okay, okay, I can do this. I like it. You know, I felt like I was being artistic with the food and I felt like I was still managing, you know, a team. So, so I opened a food truck. That was my first baby. Um, that was called Cuban Cube. And I was 21, maybe. Yeah, well, 21, 22. And I did that with my brother, Jonathan, who's also in the family business. And we did that for a few years. It was interesting to work <laughs> with my brother on the road, for sure, in the heat, in the Miami heat. And uh, we did some really cool things. And, and then, you know, eventually I said, OK, I think we've established a name for ourselves, you know, on our own without being tied to, you know, the, my parents' restaurant. And I opened my first brick and mortar, Finca Table and Tap in 2014. And we've been here for eight years. And uh, since then we've opened Amelia's 1931 about five years ago, which right now we are expanding. We just got a liquor license. And in about two months, we should be fully open with 150 seats. You know, we went from 50 seats to 150 now uh, with a full liquor license. And we're changing the concept to be more of like a fine dining speakeasy, uh, vibe the first of its kind in, in West Kendall and uh, my latest project that I opened in October of this year is called Barbacoa which is in in Doral and that is you know all our my all of my concepts are Latin Asian fusion craft bar um, trying to source as many local ingredients as we can and you know just giving value to the guests you know honest prices honest food good service and great cocktails that's outstanding well yeah first of all Great rise to where you are right now. I think that's an awesome story for everybody here. Um, you know, when you look at your uh, your concepts you have right now, and I mean, you know, you you were you, you have a, a consistent theme going throughout them right now. But but you know, what what out of any of this, um, you know, are you excited about most right now? Right? I mean, like you you mentioned your liquor license. You mentioned uh, you know, obviously expanding Amelia's. Uh, you know, what kind of things are you excited about as you continue to grow? 
I think I'm just getting more granular and geeky in the bar right now. Um, you know, I've always loved cooking. I've always loved food. Obviously, I grew up in the kitchen with my my family. But, you know, at the other restaurants, my parents' restaurants, they don't really have a strong bar program. This is kind of a mom and pop kind of vibe. And we were the first people to kind of bring this craft cocktail bar culture to West Kendall. Um, so I've learned a lot. And, you know, as much as I love cooking, I think being a liquid chef is kind of funner because you don't sweat as much and you kind of are doing the same thing. You know, I'm not a bartender. I'm not trying to be a bartender, but I do think that um, a successful and a a very good bar is essential to to a restaurant, you know, uh, proper cocktails, proper ice. Um, a really good back bar with a good selection. And so I've been kind of diving into that that part of the business uh, lately, for sure. And now with Amelia's, you know, we're going like fine dining cocktails. So I'm excited about that. That's awesome. I, I love that phrase, liquid chef, right? So so now I, you got my mind turning here, right? So like what kind of what kind of elements or what kind of things uh, do you and your team find really exciting uh, in that in that space, in the bar space? Well, I just feel like it's kind, you're kind of, being a cook in the sense of you're mixing ingredients and making them balance. You know, you have to know flavor profiles. You have to know about dilution. You have to know about shelf life for certain juices or uh, syrups. Um, playing around with bitters, that's always fun. Uh, I just feel like there's more freedom because most people who sit at the bar say, hey, I'm in the mood for something light, refreshing, and spicy, you know, and then you get to create. You know, no one sits at a table and says, Hey, tell the chef to make me something light, fresh, and you know, <laughs> can't do that. So there's just so much freedom in the bar, and and my staff is very creative. We're all we're all pretty. A lot of them are musicians or or photographers. So you know, we just like to create, and um, and we try to get together. You know, and do biweekly cocktails where everyone kind of puts their input. Whether it's back of the house chef says, Hey, I got some extra peppers. Let's do something. Or, you know, my front of the house staff says, hey, a lot of people have been asking for lavender in our cocktails, whatever. So, you know, what we like to do is make group decisions here and get and listen to everyone's opinions on, um, you know, what to do next. So how do you get to that point where, uh, you know, people feel empowered to kind of bring their ideas, right? Because I think it's really easy to come and say, hey, you know, people want more drinks with lavender in them. And then just stare at you, right? Like, <laughs> hey, uh, you know, do you have any more ideas about what you could do with lavender? So how do you get them to engage and bring their ideas and their flavor and their perspective to these meetings? Uh, particularly, particularly at Finca, I think, you know, we've been here eight years. A lot of our staff has been here since day one. They know that you know, communication is a two-way street. We speak, they listen, they give their opinion. We listen, you know, we assess the situation there, but we definitely listen to to our employees and um and i think they're just used to it they know that they can communicate whatever they need to communicate whether it's an idea or a critique or something that can make the restaurant better um and, and i think that's what makes our team here so tight-knit because you know everyone says oh we're like a family here and it, it really is like that you know um we don't necessarily hang out every day but we spend most of our time here it's just like our everyone's right. second home so um, I think the communication aspect and listening is so, so important. Well, that's huge. And so, you know, I got to imagine, you know, with three restaurants and, and a ton going on right now, and I'm not sure if that food truck's still around, but with, with the, it's with the my house. It's, I'm trying to sell it. <laughs> it's taking up space on my lawn. <laughs> uh, you can't have that. <laughs> so with three restaurants, you know, how are you finding time to, to make your team feel, you know, valued, create that communication channel, uh, and, and to, to really bring that family environment out. I think presence is super important. You know, I come here to Finca every day. I show face, whether for it's, if it's for an hour or 10, you know, I come in every single day. They, I walk in the kitchen, they have a little coffee ready for me. It's, you know, we have our pre-shift. We talk about any issues, you know, every Thursday I have meetings with all my managers. It's our operations day. So, um, I, all the restaurants, we all get together you know, one hour every Thursday, we just go over what are the issues, what are people talking about, you know, um, and, uh, and be, yeah, I think being present, you know, be, not being an absentee owner is like very important, you know, which you can be an investor and that's great, but if you're the owner and the face, you need to be here. And I think the people appreciate that, even the guests as well. Like they'll be like, oh, wow, you're, you're here. I, you know, I saw you on the website. <laughs> like, yeah, I'm not an illusion. I'm a real person. <laughs> 
but you know, I think them seeing you and just like having a human connection is, is important. Absolutely. Okay. So that's, that is absolutely great. I mean, I know that that connection is always, you know, it's difficult to, to build, but once you have it, it's gotta be very, very valuable on both sides. Right. Yeah, it's good and it's has its pros and its cons because sometimes you make decisions based on your heart instead of like, you know, what's good for the business. But there's some sort of balance that I've learned from my mom to have like some sort of compassion and then do what's right for the business kind of thing. You know, it has to be it has to be a balance. So so how do you so your employees will bring you all these concepts? How do you get to a point where you have to maybe go against what they're looking at? Uh, but still keep them engaged, right? You know, they've got a great idea and you're like, ah, we really can't do that. And then keep them engaged. Like, how are you having that conversation? I mean, I think you just got to give them kudos for even speaking up and then saying, you know, I don't think maybe that's like the right fit for right now, but I think everyone's just used to maybe their ideas getting shot down a couple of times. I can't say yes to everything, you know, uh, <laughs> but I, I think just saying, wow, thank you for bringing that up. That's actually like interesting. Let's, you know, let's work on it or let me bring it up to the other managers and let's see if we can do something like that. Um, but just, just acknowledging that they are, you know, I don't, I don't know if we can say bad words, but having the balls to say something, yeah, you know, um, I think that that's the way of not just like, you know, shooting their ideas down, just saying, thank you. And, and keep the ideas coming. You know, we want to listen to more ideas. And that's so big these days, right? Because when you, anything you read right now, you know, the, there's all these trends and, and there's always micro trends in employment, but communication is always consistent, right? You know, they have, you have to be able to listen, understand, respond, and then they have to feel valued for the communication that they have. Right. Right. So, you know, with your managers, and this is, this is something I, I've seen a lot of lately, right? Where I'm talking to the owner, right? And the owner's like, you know, this is the vision. This is what we make happen. How do you get your managers to have the same mentality? I mean, I think that that happens during the the hiring process. I mean, I feel, I feel like if you come from a background where maybe it's you worked at a, at a restaurant or a hotel or something that was completely different than, than what we're doing here. And you don't, you know, you're kind of set in your ways and you're probably not going to get hired. I think we evaluate all that when we when we speak to them the first round of interviews you know you have to be aligned a lot of our managers which is great is they have been promotions from within so two of our managers right now one was a server for us for six years the other one worked with us for four years behind the bar so i feel they get it you know they started right. and and when you promote from within not only are you creating some um you know you're, you're giving everyone kind of uh what is the word I'm looking for? You're kind of getting everyone excited because they can do that as well. But these people, they worked other positions. So they know what they're looking for when they expect, you know, when they're expecting things from other, for, from their staff, they've worked that position. So I think that's really important. And, and promoting from within, I always tell people like, this isn't, there's no limit here. You know, you start, my best server, he's working right now, actually, uh, started as a dishwasher here, then became a buster. He dishwashed for like two days, but still, he didn't speak English. So he started as a dishwasher because he had just come from Cuba um, and he was just trying to get his foot in the door. Then he became a busser and he really wanted to be a surfer. And I said, go start taking classes, get, take some English classes. You have everything else. You're smart. You know how to work the floor. And now he's my number one server. And he's been with us since day one. And, you know, I, I think that just, um, I love seeing that. I love seeing that. So, so that makes uh, that has to make for a phenomenal culture. So, have you ever hired managers from outside of your organization and brought them in? I have, I have. Um, right now, I have about two. So, actually, no, three have been promoted, and two were from outside, and they've been here for one for seven and one for six years, or maybe even both for seven. But they've been here a while. So, like I said, we don't have a lot of turnover because we do try to create this like atmosphere where. You know, we obviously it's not a circus, but it's comfortable to work here because we're not on everyone's butt. Everyone knows what they need to do. As long as you have the proper training, you know, if you make mistakes, that's on you. It's not on us kind of thing. And I always say like, you know, everyone gets fired. If you get fired from Finca, you fired yourself. We didn't right. have it out for you. We weren't trying to get you out the door. You know, we gave you all the tools. We told you what we expected and we're here for you for whatever you need. So if you get fired, it's that's on you. 
That is awesome. I, I you know, it's funny because I've had to unfortunately terminate a lot of people in my career. And, and I think that's what it always boils down to, right? Is can you shake their hand at the end of the day? Because they knew this was coming right. because most likely they did it to themselves. Right. right. Yeah. And they pretty much I mean, everybody knows that. Yeah. And it's an uncomfortable situation to be in, but it is what it is. We're running a business and, and, you know, sometimes we have to make those calls. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, you know, as you're, as you're taking your crystal ball and you're kind of looking out right now, right. You know, uh, uh, and I'm going to go back to this, I'm going to go back to this liquid chef concept. Right. So, so, cause if you, if you're excited about talking about it, I'm excited about talking about it. All right. So, so what kind of things are you seeing coming kind of down the pike as far as, as far as that goes, uh, in the future? Well, my partner, um, she really wants to open a bar. I told her, give me a couple of years. Cause I got to get Amelia's going and that's going to be, you know, probably there every day for two years until I can kind of step away and say, all right, you're good. You're good. Three restaurants are good, you know, and our, our dream is to open a really cool cocktail bar. So that's kind of what I see in my crystal ball. We'll see uh, how that pans out. Um, but after that, after the bar, I think, I think I'm good. I think I'm done. <laughs> You know, because everyone's like, when are you opening in Broward? When are you opening in Fort Lauderdale? I'm like, can you find me a clone machine? Because I physically can't do it. And and I don't want to spread myself too thin either. I've seen so many restaurateurs and chefs like open five, four, you know, four or five, six places. And then they forget about the first baby. And then when that starts crumbling, you know, that's why I, I try to always come back to, to here, to Finca. This is my baby. This is what I need to take care of, you know. Um, this is my bread and butter. So, uh, so I definitely don't want to spread myself too thin. Well, I think that's phenomenal. And I think that's a hard concept for people to understand, right? Is it, you have to kind of understand where you are, uh, you know, where you want to be, uh, and then also when to say stop, right. because I don't think that's easy to do in this industry. Yeah, Cause I I'm very ambitious. My mom's even more ambitious. My mom is like, we got to do this. We got to do that. And I'm like, well, you want to retire like in a couple of years, um, and I eventually I'm going to have to take over my parents' places when they retire. So I'll have three, I'll have two of theirs, you know, I have hopefully a bar. It'll, it'll be a lot on my plate. And, and it's not because I'm not ambitious. I just want to be able to like have a family and um, enjoy life, which is to me, like I'm learning that as a concept this year, that life is short and you need to enjoy it. Yeah, absolutely. I could not agree more. I think uh, people who overwork themselves, it's the one thing they go back and and, and regret, right? Is that they right. didn't take the time to do the things they wanted to do. Yeah. They just I poured themselves mom, you know, and, and she's 65 and, or maybe a little older than that, but she's 66. She, um, she is enjoying life now. And, and that's where I don't want to be, you know, I'd rather enjoy now and maybe work a little harder later. You know, I don't know. I don't know really what the right formula is, but but I definitely want to enjoy life and travel and do things. I don't want to be doing that when I'm, you know, when I'm about to retire. Well, it sounds like you've built an amazing culture and a great team. So uh, I'm guessing you have a, a little bit of flexibility in your future coming to be able to enjoy some of those things. Yes, yes, yes. Awesome. Awesome. Well, I always like wrapping up the show by kind of looking ahead at the future and, and thinking about the future leaders that are coming in. So if you had to give somebody some advice as they were coming into the, the hospitality industry right now, what kind of advice would you give them? It sounds corny, but I'm going to say uh, lead by example. Um, a lot of people are surprised to see a manager or the owner, you know, myself on my hands and knees scrubbing something in the toilet, plunging the toilet, like in the bathroom, plunging the toilet, helping the dishwashers, like people, that's how you gain respect. And that's how you gain um, a staff that, that you can retain because they want to work for you because they know that you're not here to just make money off them or just to make a quick buck. You're here because you are passionate about it. You want to could like work as a team to make sure everyone's comfortable, to make sure we put out the best work and give the best service and serve the best food. And as long as you're passionate about it and you can lead, you know, whether it's with your words or your actions, but um, I, I found that to be like, weird for people and I'm like what do you mean they're like oh my other boss he would just show up and sit and have dinner with his friends and and that's it you know he 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 didn't talk to us we didn't have human connection with the owner of the other restaurant and I feel like that's that's important to to be physically here on their team working side by side with them and just having that level of respect that goes you know two ways I think that's absolutely 
that has to be one of the key factors as to why you have such an amazing culture uh, in, in all of your restaurants is because when people can see you side by side with themselves, uh, you know, you're able to build off of that, right? It's not, uh, it's not like trying to look down on people and people never right. feel that way, right? No, no, no. It's about lifting them up and just saying, you know, if you want to do this too, which it's a crazy idea, owning a restaurant is a crazy idea, but you can do it. And as long as you have a uh, drive and good work ethic, then you shouldn't have an issue. That is awesome. That is, I could not agree more. So Eileen, uh, if people want to find out more about your restaurants, where can they go? So uh, I guess the easiest way is through social media, Instagram, uh, Finca Table and Tap, Amelia's 1931, uh, Barbacoa by Finca. Uh, we have our websites up. We got Instagram. That's We put most mostly posts on Instagram. Um, and we always have like fun events going on. We had a cocktail class yesterday at Barbacoa. We're planning a murder mystery dinner for October at Finca. So we've always got fun events happening and, and we always post it on social media so they can check it out there. That's awesome. And if people wanted to reach out to you, is there, are you sure. on like LinkedIn or something or where can they uh, reach out to I you? I think I have a LinkedIn profile, but I never check it. Um, yeah, on Instagram, Eileen Andrade. Um, I'm there. I always respond to all my messages. So you can always reach out. Awesome. Well, that is wonderful. Eileen, thank you so much for your time today. A lot of great information and I wish you the best, especially on your expansion thank and you. As, you, as you continue to grow. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Chris. I appreciate it. Absolutely.